All right, this is the answer key for the Unit 5 Progress Check Multiple Choice Questions. All right, so there's 27 of these, so we'll see if we get them done in, in one shot. Otherwise, it might take a couple. All right, so anyway, question number one. This is uh, the method of initial rates. So we have these two reactants, X and Y, and then we have the, the rate of the reaction right over here. So we want to look and see... Um, how the, the change in concentration is going to affect this rate. So to figure out the order for X, uh, we want two experiments or two trials where only X is changing. Um, so uh, Y is constant in, in experiment two and three. So that's what we want to use. So, and we want to look by, by what factor is X changing. So it goes from 0.15 to 0.30. So X is doubling. Then we want to see, well, what happens to the rate when that happens? So it goes from 64 to 128, so it's also doubling. So if they change by the same factor, that tells us that it's going to be first order with respect to x. All right, so x to the first order. Now we do the same thing for y, and we want to use experiment 1 and 2, where x is held constant. y is doubling. It's going from 0.10 to 0.20. And then the rate goes from 32 to 64, so it also doubles. So when y doubles the rate doubles, so that tells us it's also first order with respect to Y2. So it's going to be first order for both those, so that's going to be letter A right there. All right, question number two, we have the same method of initial rates right here. Okay, so this one, the question is based on the information above, determine the initial rate of disappearance of X in experiment one. All right, so... Um, We have this rate right here. We look at the balanced equation. That has a coefficient of 2. So this is using a, a balanced equation to compare rates. So in experiment 1, we had the rate of appearance of this x2, y2 of, of 32. And then it says uh, molarity per second. That's moles per liter per second. So that's the rate. Okay, so x has a coefficient of 2. So its rate is going to be twice that of x2, y2. It's just, just a mole ratio. So x is going to get consumed twice as fast as this x2, y2 is going to be produced, just based on the difference in their, in their coefficients. So 32, we're going to have to double that for the rate of disappearance of x. So it's going to be 64. So letter C. Okay, question three, the same method of initial rates right here. All right, so the question is now, a second chemist repeated the three experiments and observed that the reaction rates were considerably greater than those measured by the first chemist, even though the concentration of the reactants and the temperature in the lab were the same as they were for the first chemist. Uh, which of the following is the best pairing of a claim about the most likely cause for greater rates measured by the second chemist and a valid justification? Okay, so we got to look at all these. So this says the, uh, the temperature was the same, so it's not going to be anything about that. Um, so letter A, <clears throat> the pressures of the gases used by the second chemist must have been lower than that used by the first chemist, thus the collisions between the reacting particles were less frequent. So no, if the, the pressure would have to be higher to have more frequent collisions. All right, the letter B, the pressure of the gases used by the second chemist must have been lower. So again, uh, the second chemist had faster reactions, so they'd want to have higher pressures or higher concentrations of the gases, so it's not going to be B. Uh, the second chemist must have added a catalyst, so a catalyst would speed it up, so that it's going to be C or D. Now we have to look at the, the explanation. So thus providing a different reaction pathway for the reactant particles to react with an activation energy that was lower than that of the uncatalyzed reaction. So that's all true. So letter C looks good. Now this one says the second chemist added a catalyst, but providing energy to reacting particles to increase the rate. So a catalyst doesn't give more energy to the reacting particles. It just gives them a lower energy pathway. So it's got to be letter C. Okay, question four. So we have this equation right here. A chemical equation shown above represents the hydrolysis of sucrose. Under certain conditions, the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of sucrose. 
which statement supports how a change in conditions can increase the rate of the reaction. So this is again, just like the last one, it's knowing the different factors and how they affect uh, reaction rates. So increasing the amount of water in which the sugar is dissolved will increase the frequency. So if you increase the water, you're gonna decrease the concentration. So that won't give you a, a higher frequency of collision. So it's not a uh, decrease in the temperature will increase the frequency. Well, if you decrease the temperature, the particles move slower. So it's not going to increase the frequency. Letter C, increasing the concentration will increase the rate of hydrolysis by increasing the frequency of collisions. Uh, that is true. And then letter D, decreasing the concentration will increase the rate. No, it's increasing the concentration, you get more collisions in a faster rate. So it's letter C. Okay, question number five. So we have another setup with two trials, okay? So the information in the data table above represents two different trials for an experiment to study the rate of reaction between NO and H2 as represented by the balanced equation above the table. Which of the following statements provides the correct explanation for why the initial rate of formation of N2 was greater in trial two than in trial one? So we have the rate is, is double that what we have in, in trial one. And the only difference is the concentration of H2 is higher in trial two. So it's, it's carried out at the same temperature, so that's not going to be a factor. Um, it's just going to be the frequency of collisions between reactant molecules is greater. So we have a higher concentration, so we're going to have more collisions. So letter B. Um, the rate constant, K, is dependent on temperature only. So if we have a constant temperature, then the rate constant will stay the same. So it's not going to be C or D. And the activation energy, um, that, that only changes with a catalyst. So it's got to be letter B. Okay, question number six. So this is talking about this reaction here. It's another question about the factors that affect a rate of reaction. So in this one, you have a five gram piece of zinc. And then in trial two, you have five grams of powdered zinc. So um, if you have a powder, a powder has a lot more surface area than just a, a solid piece. So there's gonna be more collisions and, and trial two will be faster. So the question is which trial will have a faster initial rate and why? So it's gonna be trial two. Um, because the sample of zinc has a greater surface area for the reaction to take place. So it's going to be letter D. Okay, so we have this equation for number seven. It says the rate of the reaction represented by the chemical equation shown above is expressed with this right here. Based on this information, which of the following claims is correct? So the reaction will proceed at a slower rate with increased temp. No, increased temp will increase the rate, so it's not A. The rate of reaction will double when the concentration of these two are doubled. If you, if you double both of them, that will quadruple the rate um, because they're, they're both first order. So if we double them, it'd be two times two, it'd be four times the, the initial rate. So the rate of the reaction will double if the concentration of CH3I is doubled while keeping NaOH constant. That's true. If you just double one of them, then the rate will double. And then the larger amount of C will, will, produce, will be produced if the concentrations are half. Well, if we have half the amount of this, we're going to get less, not, not a larger amount. So it's got to be letter C. Okay, question eight. Um, this is uh, the integrated rate law, so 5.3, that section. And with this, we just look for what gives us a straight line. So we have a straight line graph right here, and that's natural log of the concentration versus time. That's an indicator that's a first order reaction. So letter B. Question nine. So this bismuth 214, that's this right here. It undergoes first order radioactive decay by releasing the beta particle as represented in this equation right here. Which of the following quantities plotted versus time will produce a straight line? So we don't need to know how this whole reaction goes. All you got to know is it's first order. And in a first order reaction, it's the, the natural log of the concentration of this reactant versus time that gives you a straight line. 
So it's going to be the natural log of the bismuth right here, letter C. Um, concentration versus time, that tells you it's zero order. If it's one over the concentration, that's second order. But this is first order, so it's going to be letter C. Okay, uh, question 10. We have another reaction right here. Okay, and, and another graph. Now, in this graph, it's the concentration versus time that's giving you a straight line. So if it's concentration versus time, that tells you it's zero order. And anything that's zero order doesn't show up in the rate law. So it's just going to be letter A. Okay, question 11, you have this two-step mechanism. Uh, which of the following statements about the overall reaction and the rate laws of the elementary reactions is correct? Okay, so when we when we put these two together, um, this iodide ion, I negative, will cancel. That's a catalyst. And this IO negative will cancel. That's an intermediate. So we'd have two of these H2O2s, two waters, and an oxygen as your, as your products. So that eliminates uh, A and B. So C and D are still options. Now you look for the, the rate laws. For each elementary step, you just look at the reactants. So for step one, we have H2O2 and, and I negative. So that's going to be the, the correct rate law for step one. So it's C. <clears throat> OK, question 12. We have this uh, three-step mechanism. So based on the proposed mechanism, which of the following correctly identifies both the chemical equation and the rate law? So I would just look at the, the rate law for the slow step. You look at the reactants in the slow step, and it's just one of these N2O5s. So it's going to be N2O5 to the first order. Um, and the only choice where we have that is letter B. And the, I'm sure the overall reaction would match up because this is the only correct rate law equation. <clears throat> okay, 13. Okay, now with this one, we have a missing step. So we have the overall reaction. So we know that um, in the overall reaction, we have two of these. In step two, you just have one. So that has to be one of the products in step one. And then this F is canceled out in the overall equation. So that has to be another product. So it has to be NO2F plus F on the right side. Then on the reactant side, we have to have another one of these NO2s, and then we have to have F2 on the, on the reactants, because that doesn't show up in step two, but it's in the overall, so it's gotta be in step one. So the only one that matches up with that is letter A. Okay. Well, this one is talking about uh, the orientation for a successful collision. <clears throat> so we have three cho four choices up here. The, the equations shown above represent four elementary reactions. Which of the following identifies the reaction in which the number of successful collisions and reaction rate are independent of the orientation? Okay, so with this, it, it's got to be letter A because we just have two oxygen atoms that form this O2 molecule. So it's not going <clears> to <throat> depend on which part of the oxygen uh, is colliding. So it's got to be reaction A. So A. All right, question 15 is another question about uh, orientation for a successful collision. All right, so we have... Um, a CO molecule and an NO2 molecule. It says the products are CO2 and NO. So what happens to go from reactants to products is there has to be a bond that forms between carbon and an oxygen that's in NO2. So diagram one is showing that carbon is colliding with an oxygen from NO2. So that, that, that will possibly give us an effective collision. We're not going to form a bond between carbon and nitrogen. So diagram two, this is a, this will give us an orientation of a collision that, that won't be effective. So um, we know it's either A or B. So it's going to be a uh, letter B because it's talking about the orientation. So the proper orientation to form a new carbon-oxygen bond, as long as they have enough energy to overcome the.